Hi everyone, uh, it's been a little while since I made a big video so I thought uh, it was about time after hearing a lot of the stuff I've been uh, hearing recently about uh, things like reflex profiles and uh, terms like reflex mode um, time to maybe look at debunking some of the myths and actually start uh, looking at some of the science as verified by NASA uh, almost about many years ago by the Horton brothers and maybe start to look at how this actually applies to our wings and try and get some of the myths like the uh, this uh, theoretical elevator on the back of the wing uh, try and show what a load of bunkum that is and uh, get some truth into the story so let's start by talking about um, say a regular paraglider wing and what makes our wings different from uh, a regular standard paraglider wing in order to do this, I'm going to have to really utilise a few standard terms that hopefully most of you know, but uh, just in case you don't, I'll do a quick refresh here. I'm going to talk about um, cord line, and a cord line is a line through the front of the wing going through to the very back of the wing. Um, so it's a, generally a straight line that goes straight from front to back, and this is going to be very important when differentiating between the three types of wing I'm initially going to mention. Now, the other things I'm going to also talk about slightly later on are angle of attack and incidence. Now, uh, both of these involve the cord line, which is why I mentioned that first. The incidence of a wing is the angle that the wing is set at on the particular aircraft. So for us, I would say that the best way to describe incidence is the angle between the cord line of the wing and uh, say the pilot underneath, the angle the wing is set at. Now the angle of attack is ever so slightly different to the incidence because the angle of attack is the angle between the cord line and the relative airflow. Now the relative airflow, if we're flying straight and level, uh, in level flight, is going to be horizontal. However, if we're in climbing or descending flight, or if we uh, meet a, an updraft or a downdraft, uh, then we are not going to have our oncoming airflow as horizontal. So the, just to recap, the angle of attack, which is often shortened to the term alpha, is the angle between the cord line of the wing and the relative airflow. So here is a conventional aerofoil. This is what you'll find on a standard paraglider wing. Now I've drawn a dotted line, which you'll see fairly low down on the wing section, that goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge of the wing. Now the important thing with this is to note that there's far more curvature on the top surface of the wing than there is on the underside of the wing. This is a conventional aerofoil section. Now here I've drawn a, and cut out a uh, reflex airfoil, also known as a reverse camber airfoil, or a negative camber aerofoil, but we know them in paramotoring as a reflex aerofoil. Now again, I've drawn a dotted line to show the cord line. Uh, again, it goes between the leading edge of the wing and the trailing edge of the wing, but you can see that the, the dotted line actually disappears above the top surface of the wing even. The curvature of the wing is actually greater on the underside than it is on the top. And this is very important. We'll be talking a lot more about the impact this has later. Now here I've drawn another wing section called a symmetrical airfoil. Now you can see here that the curvature is the same on top as it is beneath. And the cord line, you can see, actually divides the wing basically in two. Now this has no real benefit for us in paramotoring, but there is one particular quality of a symmetrical airfoil that is quite relevant to us to, ex to explain how reflex works, or the dividing point, should I say, between reflex and a conventional aerofoil. Now, out of interest, that particular quality that this has makes this particular wing very suitable for aerobatic aircraft. So you'll find this is what all the pit specials and extras and caps and all the various aerobatic aircraft tend to use. Now when we're in flight, there are four forces that are always being resolved as we fly along. There are two vertical ones, lift and weight, which are the ones that I'll be concentrating on in this video. There's also thrust and drag, however they don't really feature quite so much uh, in this part of the video. So I'm just going to look at the lift and weight vectors. Now the whole of the wing creates lift, 
Even in a reflex glider, despite what people tell you about the back of the wing stopping producing lift, the whole of the wing produces lift, but the distribution of that lift is summarised into one force called lift, which we draw as a single arrow, and the point at which that applies from we refer to as the centre of pressure. You'll sometimes hear it called centre of lift, but actually its real term is centre of pressure, or C of P as I sometimes call it. The weight, which is primarily the suspended mass, the pilot and the paramotor underneath, acts from a point much lower down called the centre of gravity, or C of G. Now the key thing to understand is that the resultant of all the lift forces is always going to try and be over the top of the weight at the centre of gravity. So the C of P is constantly trying to put itself above the C of G. This is a vital thing to understand to see how reflex works. Now we're going to come to the really important bit. Now I'm showing here the conventional aeropole as used in a regular paraglider. The arrow with the three heads on it is the relative airflow. So in this case we're flying pretty well level. So the arrow is going straight from left to right. So we're not climbing, we're not descending, we're not in lift, we're not in sync. You'll notice that the, the wing is being presented at a positive angle of attack, a positive alpha, in order to generate uh, a suitable amount of lift to support the mass. I haven't shown the weight in here, I'm just looking at the lift acting around the centre of pressure. Now the reason that this is so important is that when the angle of attack is increased, which can be done either by flying into an updraft which will change the arrows so that it points up like so, or if we were to apply brake, that would pull down the trailing edge and increase the angle of attack. Then the lift vector up here, acting on the centre of pressure, the lift vector will move forwards. So I'm going to increase the angle of attack and the lift vector will move forwards. Now conversely, if I was to come back into, say, level flight again, into still air, should I say, or remove the brake input, the centre of pressure is going to move back. Now if I then fly through sink, then effectively the angle of attack is going to reduce because the airflow has a downward motion, so the lift vector around the centre of pressure will move aft. Now this is a very important thing to understand because next I'll show you what happens with a reflex wing. So here is my reflex wing. Again we're flying level in still air. We've got a slight positive angle of attack. You can see the cord line is actually uh, inclined to the oncoming airflow. So we've got a positive angle of attack here and there's our lift vector coming up from the centre of pressure. Now, when we increase the angle of attack before on the conventional aerofoil, the uh, centre of pressure actually moved forwards. But with a reflex wing, the opposite relationship exists. And this is the important thing about a reflex wing. So if the angle of attack increases, now the centre of pressure goes backwards instead of forwards. If we decrease the angle of attack, the centre of pressure comes forwards rather than backwards. This is the key thing to under understand and I'll explain why in a moment. Now I mentioned earlier about symmetrical aerofoils as they're used on um, aerobatic aircraft. Now the significant thing about the symmetrical aerofoil, not that we use it at all in, in uh, paramotoring, but the important thing with this is that with angle of attack change with a symmetrical aerofoil, the centre of pressure does not move at all with angle of attack change. So as I change the angle of attack there is no movement in the centre of pressure. So this is the defining point between a conventional aerofoil and a reflex aerofoil. When the net curvature above and below the wing is the same then there's no centre of pressure movement. So consequently because of this the effect of reflex profile is actually a digital thing. Reflex makes the centre of pressure move in the opposite direction from a conventional aerofoil. So a wing can either exhibit a reflex quality or not. 
you can't really quantify it. It either is or it isn't. So having shown you those diagrams, we can now use that knowledge to then see how it applies to our wings. So if you're flying on a conventional paraglider and you're in nice steady flight and all of a sudden the, uh, you fly into a thermal, say, so the, you now have an updraft, so the angle of attack has increased on the wing. Now on the uh, regular paraglider, the centre of pressure moves forwards, but the centre of pressure wants to park itself over the top of the centre of gravity. So bearing in mind the wing pivots around the carabiners, for the centre of pressure to get over the centre of gravity, the wing has to move back. And when it moves back, because it's held at the bottom, it increases its angle of attack further. So therefore, the centre of pressure moves even further forward again, which then increases the angle of attack even further still. So it's a, a divergent situation, it's unstable. Now look at it from the point of view of the reflex wing. You're flying along, you fly into a thermal, the angle of attack increases, but this time the centre of pressure moves back. So the wing trying to put the centre of pressure over the centre of gravity naturally, automatically, pitches down. So the wing moves forwards, decreases its angle of attack by itself without any pilot input. That's the reason why it reflex works. Nothing to do with fake elevators at, at the back of the wing at all. The same happens for reducing angle of attack as well. Exactly the same principles apply. And as you can see, it's really, really simple. Not the difficulty uh, the, of the descriptions that are being banded around. It is a very, very straightforward principle. So consequently, what we actually have are two different profiles that can be used on a paraglider wing. Well, actually, there's many different profiles, but there's two styles of uh, profile. There's the naturally unstable paraglider style, which has performance benefits, which is why they use them, or there's the slightly less um, efficient reflex profile, which is, allows us to uh, have a sort of an automatic pitch stability without the pilot having to put any influence in. Now, whether you trust that or not when the going gets tough is a whole different argument I'm not going to go into on this video. Uh, I have my own views uh, and I will share those privately, um, but in reality, uh, really, you need to actually uh, consider whether your wing is exhibiting a reflex profile or a non-reflex profile. Now, on that subject, it brings us on to this very, very strange terminology that's coming round now of full reflex and semi-reflex. What on earth is all that about? Either a wing has reflex profile and its centre of pressure moves one way, or it's non-reflex and its centre of pressure move, moves the other way. One is divergent, one is stable. Right? They can only be one thing or the other. Now, I think what people are trying to say is talking about wings that maybe are reflexed at some trim settings and not at others. Well, there's so much rubbish going around about this. I keep hearing people talk about putting my wing into reflex mode. Well, I haven't known of any paramotor wing that has not been reflexed at any trim setting since the Paramania revolution. Now, I might be wrong on that because I only really know the wings particularly from the more mainstream providers like uh, Dudec, Ozone, Paramania, uh, APCO, uh, that kind of thing. However, if you look at any of the current Dudec or Ozone wings, <coughs> excuse me, if you look at any of those, they all are reflex at all trim settings. The revolution was uh, a standard aerofoil at the slowest trim settings and once you got, I think it was above the red line, um, then it started to exhibit reflex in its profile. So technically, if you take wings like my Hadron, for example, even at the slowest trim setting, it's a reflex wing. At any trim setting, it's a reflex wing. It's the same on my Viper 3. At all trim settings, it's reflex it will automatically stabilise. Now, here comes the next thing, right? There is a difference between different manufacturers' take on reflex, and that is how they 
utilise the risers to change the reflex profile as you let trim out. Now with uh, wings from ozone, the reflex profile does not change as you let the trims out. It's the same profile throughout the whole trim range. What happens when you let the trims out is that the incidence of the wing changes, the angle of the wing relative to the pilot. That has the follow-on effect of changing the angle of attack. Now the Hadrons, both the original Hadron and the Hadron XX from Dudek, are the same. They keep the same uh, reflex profile, the same wing profile, at all trim settings. So as you let the trims out, the incidence changes and then the angle of attack changes. Now if you look at the other Dudek wings, they use a different philosophy on those. So on wings like the Nucleon range, uh, the Universal I think, certainly on the Synthesis and on the old Reaction, all the, those kind of wings, with those when you let the trims out, yes, the incidence changed and the angle of attack therefore got greater as, uh, sorry, angle of attack would reduce as you let the trims out, but they also changed the reflex profile as well. So they got more and more curvature, negative camber, in the wing as the trims were let out as well. So they became super solid as you went fast, rather than just naturally pitch positive like the Ozone and the Hadron um, wings. This is a really important thing to understand because you keep hearing people talk about things like semi-reflex and full reflex, but there is no definition of this anywhere. So semi-reflex could mean that uh, you know a wing that is natural, uh, conventional, should I say, uh, profile at slow trim and reflexed at fast trim, but I haven't seen one of those for years. It could also mean, like some of the uh, paraglider wings coming out now, that they might have reflex in the center section, but not in the tips for various other aerodynamic reasons. But really, it doesn't mean anything in air sport, nothing of substance. And the same with full reflex. Understand whether your wing has reflex profile or not, and if it is all parts of the trim range, which I suspect you'll find it is. So that was a bit of heavy chat for a few minutes there, and I hope you've managed to stay with me on this. But just to summarise it, the point I'm trying to make is that when you're flying along and the angle of attack increases on your wing, on a conventional wing the centre of pressure will move forwards and you need to actively fly in order to keep the wing stable. On a reflex wing, when the angle of attack increases, the centre of pressure will move back and the wing will fly itself back into balance. And this is the difference. There's no elevators at the back of the wing or any of this other rubbish. It's purely about the centre of pressure trying to keep itself above the centre of gravity. Or centre of gravity trying to keep itself under the centre of pressure, depending on which way you want to look at it. It's that simple. It's always been that simple. And there's been so much misinformation, it was time that this myth was cured.